Right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa nabiyyina wa manana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Can you go back to the uh, original first slide? Um, so welcome everyone to the dual enrollment seminar. Um, so alhamdulillah, we have all the Al Noor Academy High School here, um, but we also uh, have people joining online from uh, all over Massachusetts, all over the country actually, um, who are also learning about dual enrollment. So most of this presentation is going to be aimed at you guys. Um, we'll try to address some of those questions that they might have. Obviously the way we do dual enrollment is uh, different uh, than, than the way it works at some other um, schools and, and other places. Okay. Uh, any questions before we begin? All right, next slide. Hit the right arrow. All right, so this is the plan. We're starting right now. I'm going to be giving a presentation. I have a bunch of slides that I've uh, prepared. Um, and then uh, at around 2.30 or whenever I finish, we're gonna have some of the current duels, our current 11th and 12th graders uh, up here to uh, share some of their thoughts and uh, answer answer questions. And we'll keep them up here for the end where it'll be sort of open Q&A. Um, so if you have any questions, try to wait till the end. If you're on Zoom, uh, please put your questions in as they come up, at, but we'll most likely answer them at the end unless it's something like I can't hear you or something like that. All right, Khair? Bismillah. All right, next slide. So, sorry, it's a little hard to see here. Um, so I wanted to start with uh, some quotes. Uh, this first one, Shanza, you're the one who suggested this uh, first quote. Mm -hmm. Could you read it, please? Look, if you have one, uh, one shop or one occupancy, you lose everything you ever wanted in one moment. Would you capture it or let it slip? All right, is that Shakespeare? That is not Shakespeare. Not Shakespeare. Who is it? Yes. Slim Shady, yes, okay, correct. But what's his, what's the other name he goes by? Marshall, Marshall Mathers or Eminem, right? The rapper Marshall was actually my original Muslim, uh, my given name when I was born. So uh, Eminem is, mashallah, very, very talented with his uh, lyrics. And uh, this is a great, um, can you just, Shanzai, can you move the camera a little? because. All right. So if you had one shot or one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted in one moment, would you capture it or just let it slip, right? The reason we're starting with that is because this is a framework for everything, right? Certainly about this dual enrollment and this opportunities that you have with college and, and everything, right? But just think of it as you have a shot. Right now, you guys, mashallah, are going to uh, a private school, your parents have invested a lot in your education. You're, we're, we're right now in a beautiful masjid, right? Getting to remember a lot. What's all that noise? Is that such a, they're just leaving. Um, so try to try to take advantage of, uh, of this time. Okay, next quote. Could one of the girls read it, please? Habiba, mashallah, you got volunteered by your good friend, Maya. Education is the most Excellent. And who said that? Who is Nelson Mandela? Yes. He was what? Something with South Africa. Okay. Mashallah. Can we go a little deeper? Uh, civil rights activist and South African president. Yep. He was jailed for many years. He was, uh, what, what was the system they used in, in South Africa, which Unfortunately, it's used in other places like what's happening in the West Bank in Palestine. Yes. Apartheid. Apartheid, right? And so Nelson Mandela, not single-handedly, but was the, the uh, front person for changing South Africa from being the country where uh, you know the, the black native black population was, was suppressed to one uh, which is now they're the ones who brought the the case at the International Court of Justice against Israel and the genocide that's going on there, right? So this is a huge change. And as he said here, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Most of what he learned was in prison, right? He spent his time in prison to transform himself and to become an, 
you know, this amazing person. So you guys aren't in prison, right? You have so many freedoms, but in some senses being in prison, that's what happened with Malcolm X as well. As well. When you don't have those distractions, you can get so much. So don't think of dual enrollment and high school and college as a prison, but still use it in the same way that these amazing leaders did. Was there a question back there? Yes. Is he South African? Yes. Yep. He And he later became the president of South Africa, right? I lived in South Africa shortly after I graduated college. And, uh, and you know, at that time he was, I believe he was still the president. Um, okay, next one. One of the brothers, read this quote. Yahya. The beautiful tale of learning that nobody can take in All right, E.B. King, uh, another uh, uh, great, uh, famous musician. The beautiful thing about learning is that nobody can take it away from you. Mr. Booth, Allah yarhamu, if you guys were here, do you ever remember him talking about that? He used to tell this story about being uh, at Wolfboro, I think, which is a summer program, sort of fancy summer program. And there was this Saudi prince there, or Saudi royalty, whose son was in the summer program. And he said something to the effect of, I can, I have so much money, I can buy my son anything he wants. But the one thing I can't buy him is an education because that's something you have to take. It's not just given to you, right? So this is the same idea. And once you learn something, nobody can take it away from you. And final one. Yep. Yep, opportunities don't happen, you create them. Right? So a lot of people look at people and they say, why are, are some people so lucky? Right? Some people are so lucky. They have so many things happen for them. You can manufacture your own luck. There is some element of luck. Of course, it's the qadr and all that from Allah SWT. But if you put yourself in more situations and you increase the surface area where you can attract luck, right? then you're much more likely to have those lucky breaks. So if you always just stay in your room and you're just scrolling through TikTok all day, you're giving yourself very few chances to get lucky. Whereas if you put yourself out there and you know are volunteering and are meeting lots of people and every time you go to a gathering, you're talking to them and you're going to duel and you're getting to know your professors, the chances of an internship or some other opportunity or some job coming up are much, much higher. So opportunities don't just happen, you create them. All right, next slide. So what is dual enrollment? That's what we're here to talk about. So dual enrollment, uh, we're currently talking about Massachusetts because that's where we are and that's what we're primarily talking about again. But for the people on Zoom who are from Texas and other places, uh, you know, it's similar, but, but uh, probably a little bit different. So the CDEP, Commonwealth Dual Enrollment Program was uh, created way back in the, in the early 90s and then it was later restarted. But essentially the big idea is that you're simultaneously taking classes in high school and on and college at the same time. So it looks differently in some different schools. So some schools, they will have a contract where they bring university professors onto their campus to teach advanced dual enrollment classes. We have done that once or twice here in the summer, but that's generally not the way we do it. What, the way we do it is you guys go to those colleges yourself and take the classes uh, on campus uh, and, and so on, right? Um, other, for people in public schools and so on, uh, when they, let's say they're very good at math, they did Russian School of Math throughout their middle school years and they were done with pre-cal after ninth grade and they've already finished like BC calculus and they, they still have a year or two left of high school, then they might take a dual enrollment class to get to a higher level math that isn't offered by their high school, right? And um, yeah, so next one. So what are some of the reasons to do dual enrollment? Obviously, it's the only real option for us in junior or senior year, but why do we do it? And why might someone uh, else consider doing it? So the biggest thing, or one of the biggest things, is that it can save time and money. Okay, does anyone know how it saves time? How can dual enrollment save time? Yep. Excellent. So when you're going, many people, have you ever heard of the one of the, one of the ways to get a college degree is to do something they call two plus two. Does anyone know what two plus two means? One. Yep. Um, 
Excellent. Okay. So one of the, and, and people do this for lots of different reasons, but one of the main ones is cost and is they'll do two years at a community college, right? They'll get their associate's degree most likely, and then they'll transfer for their final two years to a four-year college, right? The way we've set up dual enrollment, you can almost do that while you're in high school. You're essentially doing a two plus two program. Now we don't, you don't quite take two full years of credits unless you really, really push it, right? But you oftentimes will get at least one to one and a half years of credits. Now there's a big caveat here. It depends where you end up going to college. We'll talk about this more, but if at the extreme you get into a, a really top flight school, you get into Harvard, for example, okay? Harvard and other top schools like that are very stingy about accepting credits from other institutions. They don't want you, they don't think, and they're probably right, that a Quincy College class is equivalent to their Harvard class, right? So they want you to be on campus for the full four years. And most likely if you get into a school like that, you wanna be on the campus for the full four years because of the, all those opportunities that come up and so on. However, there are many, many schools, right? Like uh, UMass Boston, which is a very popular school for our students and most other uh, public schools. And in general, uh, you know, many, many schools, which accept almost all of your dual enrollment credits, which means that many Elnorians graduate just three years, they get their bachelor's degree just three years after they get their high school diploma or even two and a half years, right? So that saves a lot of time. Also, it's much less expensive, right? That's the main reason people do two plus two because it costs less to go to community college and then to transfer to four-year school. College is one of the biggest uh, investments other than maybe your house and if you're crazy, your wedding uh, that you're ever going to make, right? College, some colleges are getting near close to when all fees are included, about $100,000 a year. Now, very few people are paying that full price. That's that's the really top price. But still, college is incredibly expensive. So if you can uh, get those credits while you're still in high school, then it's a pretty big uh, benefit. All right, um, so that's sort of what it said there. And we haven't done this for a while, but you can actually, if you really push yourself, get an associate's degree while you're still here in um, uh, high school. Uh, Let's see, other benefits. You get a taste of college life while you're still in high school. So, and again, there's a caveat here that that's if you're going and taking classes actually on campus. Okay, we'll talk about doing classes on campus versus online. If you take the classes on the college campuses, you're really getting a taste of what, you know, your life after El Nora will be like. And there are a lot of challenges that you face if you've been in an Islamic school your whole life. How many of you, went to uh, El Nor Sharon before you came here, at least for some time. So about half of you. So a lot of people, you know, they've been in Islamic school, so you've probably never been asked here about your pronouns, right? Have any of your teachers asked you about your pronouns? No? Okay, they might teach about pronouns, but we're teaching about like subject and object pronouns, not like, um, you know, the other, the other type of uh, stuff. So, how do you navigate that when you're when you're in college? You'll you'll have classmates of lots of different ideas. You'll hear things, and sometimes you'll be confused, or maybe you'll even get into some sort of um, debate with people. And this is where it's nice to be able to come back and have someone like Brother Sufyan, who mashallah is an Islamic scholar, who you can really talk through things like that, and just makes the process of switching to college uh, a lot easier. Um, and, and then the other thing is choosing your classes in college uh, is very similar to choosing dual enrollment classes. And one of the great things about college, the reason I wish I could go back to college is they have these huge course catalogs and you can really design a course of study that's really connected to what you wanna study. So that's one of the huge benefits of dual enrollment that as opposed to El Nor where we might have honors and CP, those are the only choices for the class. Right here, you can take psychology, you can take neurobiology, you can take you know, um, uh, microeconomics, you can take all sorts of interesting different sorts of classes. Next slide. All right, so a framework for your education. We have another poem. Who can read our poem, Invictus? 
Amir wants to read it. He looks very excited. It matters not how straight the gate, how tried the punishments the scroll. I'm the master of my fate. I'm the captain of my soul. All right, are you noticing a theme here with all these quotes? I'm an English teacher in my heart, so that's what I like to do, poems and things. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Okay, now let's look at the cartoon. I know it's a little small. Someone with good eyesight can read it. Anyone can read it? Uh, okay. Pretend you're starring in a reality show about a kid who can make his dreams come true who works hard and gets good grades. All right. So that's the teacher speaking to the kid. Pretend you're starring in a reality show about a kid who can make his dreams come true if he works hard and gets good grades. Why is that a comic? Why is that in the funny pages? What's the irony here? Come on, Brother Brendan's a very good English teacher. I know you guys can understand this. Yes. Exactly. He doesn't need to pretend. Okay. We're we're in the society where like reality show equals reality. So there she's using that sort of metaphor for him, but we don't need to pretend. We are in this reality show. Have you guys seen the Truman show? I've seen the Truman show. Didn't we watch it and yeah. you guys were in, no? Cool. Yeah. All right. The whole idea is that life is a reality show. Um, what's his name? Jim Carrey. He is in this reality show. Everyone else knows it's a reality show, but he doesn't. He thinks it's real life, right? You can think of your life that way, right? But the reality is if you work hard and you first set dreams and you set goals and you write those goals down, then you can get... And then you get good grades, then you can actually make them come true. So again, this is the opportunity that you have. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Go ahead. Uh, All right. Uh, so this is El Nor criteria for entering dual enrollment. Now this may be different for other schools. Um, so uh, with that in mind, so you do. Uh, you're supposed to attend El Nor in tenth grade. Okay, there have been exceptions made to that, um, but in general, the rule is that you should uh, uh, be at El Nor in 10th grade. Um, your GPA, okay, if you have a GPA of 3.3 or higher, you are automatically admitted into dual enrollment. If you have a GPA of 3.0 or higher, you get in, but you're sort of on probation, like, like we have a watching period. If your GPA is below 3.0, then you uh, you don't automatically qualify, okay? If it's a, essentially if it's above two point seven, then there's a good chance that that brother Sofian and myself, sister Sarah, whoever's uh, in charge of things at that time, uh, might allow you to go. Um, some colleges require you to have a three point oh GPA, like Bridgewater State is pretty strict about that. Um, so, uh, but the if you're below that, right? then there's a good chance you won't qualify. And in general, the students who really struggle at El Nor really, really struggle at, uh, at, at college. That said, the students who do well here, which is the vast majority of our students, do very well in college. We'll look at that uh, as, we, as we go forward. So if you're in 10th grade now, and you're in that danger zone of being in the two point, uh, less than a 3.0 GPA, this is the time to really step up. So we look at your full, GPA, your ninth and 10th grade GPA uh, cumulative, right? And uh, that's sort of the, the deep, uh, what we look at. Um, some colleges will also have placement tests, right? BSU has AccuPlacer, is that right? Yeah. I don't think Quincy does, um, but th that will help determine which, especially math and English class you start with. Um, you obviously shouldn't have major discipline issues. And this is an important one, right? When you're, at college, you're still representing Al Noor Academy, right? So you should adhere to Islamic uh, behavior obligations. You don't want to, you know, flip your Islam switch off as soon as you leave the doors of the building, right? You should have, uh, you know, uh, the same uh, principles that you have here. You should still uh, most humble Al Noorians have started. Uh, they built a musalla, which it sounds like now isn't quite as well established, uh, but at, at Quincy, and there are places to, to pray on campus. Just remember that's the first and foremost, uh, your biggest obligation. All right, next. 
This is just the GPA chart. You can find this in the student handbook, but just so you understand, um, the GPA that we talk about here at school and that we give high honor roll, that's based on a 4.0 system. And it's really Jupiter's special sauce, right? They look at things like attendance and um, you know, uh, daily muhasaba and things like that. Whereas the college transcript, which is the official one that colleges use um, uh, when, you, when you're actually applying to the four-year college at the end, they really are only interested in your academic classes uh, and you know the things like religion and Quran and Arabic, those classes all get reported to colleges, whereas the other classes are pass-fail, right? So gym, for example, is, is pass-fail. As long as you pass gym, then it doesn't have an impact on your GPA. Whereas here, some of those things can. Um, there's also a difference here at El Nor between CP and honors, right? Essentially, if you take honors everything, right? Honors English, honors uh, chemistry, uh, you're in advanced Arabic, that's the honors equivalent. Religion is considered honors no matter what, so everyone has at least that one honors class. Then your top weighted GPA at El Nor can be a 5.0. If, on the other hand, uh, you take CP everything, the, the top GPA would be a 4.5. When you hear people talk about their GPAs, though, they're usually talking about the, the unweighted scale, which is out of 4.0, where an A or an A plus, anything 93 or higher is 4.0. 90, 90 to 92 is a 3.666, which is like a 3.7, and so on. And it keeps on going down. So a B is a 3, right? A C is a 2, a D is a 1, and an F is a 0, right? So Anyway, that's uh, that's that. Um, essentially, it's saying if you get A's and B's on average, you're dual eligible. If you're in the Ashab al Shiman, then you're not dual eligible. All right, let's spin that. All right, so these are uh, the Al Noor requirements. That essentially, because you're taking all of your secular classes at dual enrollment, you need to fulfill all the Massachusetts graduation requirements. Okay, so that means you need to take two years of English. Now the difference is dual enrollment classes almost always are just one semester long. So two years of English means actually four English classes. Two years of math means four math classes, right? Because they're taught by semester. You're not taking, you know, algebra two the whole year. You might take Recal in the first term in the, in the fall and calculus in the second term, right? So that's uh, that's a big difference. So it's actually done by credits, not classes, right? So you need uh, 12 credits. English classes are almost always three credits. Math classes are usually three credits, except for some high level ones, calculus and so on. Science, you also need to do two years. At least two of your science classes need to be lab sciences, okay? So biology or chemistry or physics, or nutrition or many, many other classes that have a lab, those are four credit classes, right? Whereas there are other science classes, computer science and um, you know other non-lab science classes, which you, is psychology and things like that, which you can take, um, but you need at least two lab sciences. Muhammad? So for, for math, you need uh, 12 credits? You need 12 credits for math, 12 for uh, English, 14 for science, and six for social sciences. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, it's pretty much impossible to do that. You, you would not find three, four credit math classes. But no, in that case, we would go back to the classes. Okay, You need to take uh, two full years of math. The difference is you could, and sometimes you have to because of the class availability, you could take two math classes in the fall and no math classes in the spring. Right? So you can do things a little differently. I don't recommend that. As much as possible, you want to spread everything out. But definitely, those sorts of things happen. And then the one year of social sciences, I prefer to call it, than social studies. That's not just history. right? It's not History is certainly one of those things. But there are lots of other things that fall into it. We'll see more details as we go. Keep going. All right, so science. What are the sciences? There are five main nodes of science, biology. Within biology, there's a lot of different things. There's general bio, right? Which is pretty similar to the biology class that you take here as a ninth grader, but a little bit more advanced. Um, nutrition, anatomy and physiology one and two, genetics, microbiology, environmental, 
science, right? Those are all uh, in the biology category. Chemistry, again, there's general chemistry one and two. Biochemistry, something like forensic science. So <clears throat> typically colleges have um, uh, prerequisites before you can take the higher level classes. So usually your junior year, you're, you're knocking out the, the 101 and 102 classes, the lower level classes, so that inshallah senior year, you can be taking some of those 200 level classes. Does everyone know how that system works in college? A 100 level class means that typically it's taken by which year? Freshman. Freshman, freshman in college, right? A 200 class is taken by sophomores. Right, 300 and 400, right? So the higher the class number, the more advanced the class, at least on paper, right? So um, ideally, if you're really aiming high, you wanna get as many 200 level classes on your transcript. You can't usually do that from day one. You need to get those other things. But for example, some of our students, when they go to Bridgewater, they place directly into English 102, right? If you're a good writer and you do well on your AccuPlacer, you can skip the essentially composition one and skip straight into composition two, which means you have more flexibility with your future uh, English classes. Um, other ones, physics. So we don't do physics here at Elnor currently. You do biology and chemistry. So if you have any interest in doing anything in the STEM related things, engineering, pre-med, uh, anything like that, which many of our students do, you should absolutely take physics. Is Those are challenging courses. Um, but if you apply for engineering and you haven't taken physics, your chances of getting in are very, very low. Okay, so it's important to take classes that are connected to your areas of interest and strength. Yes. Physics under math is physics is under science. It's not under math. No. Uh, and then computer science. That's an increasingly popular one. Um, so there are lots of different computer science classes, obviously computer science one and two, you learn a lot about coding, but there's a lot of other things, web design, graphics, social media, um, uh, uh, advertising, marketing. Um, and there are other sorts of uh, classes out there. So if you see yourself in an IT type career, that's something you are interested in exploring, then you definitely wanna take these computer science classes. You still have to take some lab science, at least two of them but you can take more of these classes. Some people at the extreme have taken, you know, extra classes in computer science because they really want to stand out on their application. Keep going. So math, a little more, a little easier. So the typical classes are statistics, pre-calc, calc one and calc two, right? That's, that's sort of the general track. Some people, if their math is a little shaky, so if you're in CP math as opposed to honors math when you're here, you might start with college algebra. That might be what the AccuPlacer places you in, or you might want to do that. Uh, but in general, if you're stronger in math, again, if you want to pursue a STEM career, you'd rather jump straight into pre-cal probably or, or statistics um, and, and so on. If you finish Calc 2, right, if you're really strong in math, let's say you did Russian school of math when you were a kid and uh, or when you're younger and you're just really strong in math, then you can get into these high level maths, multivariate calculus, linear algebra, <laughs> proofs. There are a lot of interesting classes. So if you have visions of studying math or something high level or going to an MIT type school, then you'll want to be taking classes like that if possible. Next one. English. Okay, so English, again, comp one and two are, uh, most people uh, do take them. Um, and the writing is sort of the foundation for everything in your life, so you should. Um, but beyond that, there are lots of interesting classes, right? A lot of people take speech, public speaking, uh, which is a very important skill. Uh, they take their literature classes. Some of them are survey literature classes. Some of them are more things like mythology, literature of the supernatural, Shakespeare, detective fiction, cultural rhetorics, whatever that is, um, poetry classes. Right, so especially Bridgewater State has an amazing English department. You can take some really interesting English classes that are catered to your interests and look very interesting on a, on a college application. Uh, keep going. And then social science. So it's more than just history, as I said there. When I first got to Illinois, pretty much everyone took like US History 1 and US History 2, which doesn't make sense really to me because you've already taken those same classes here. You can, but 
when you when you've already taken a class in ninth and tenth grade and then you take it again, <coughs> colleges will be like, why you know why are you doubling up on on these things? So it's better to take things that you know are actually interesting to you. This is really where you can tailor it to your own interests. Again, with the uh, warning that you can't always get exactly the classes you want as we'll talk about. But so uh, there are classes about economics, government, sociology, finance, political science. Um, uh, psychology is another one. Um, we've been accepting psychology either as a social science or a science. It's sort of like a swing class between the, the, the two. Uh, it's a very popular class for people to take. You only need two of these. But if this is if you're more of a humanities person, you want to do like law school potentially, or you want to, um, you know, uh, most likely major in something outside of the STEM field, it makes sense to take more than one. Philosophy is a really uh, popular class that people have taken and gotten a lot of benefit from. Um, all right, next. And then there's electives. So I wouldn't use think of electives. That sounds very optional. And electives are not required classes, but these are classes that, that if you have a particular passion, for example, art, right? We don't do a lot of studio art. We don't do a lot of drama here at El Norte. We have limited budget, limited space, limited time. So you don't get those things which you might have gotten if you went to a bigger uh, school. So those are things you can take there. They don't count towards your graduation uh, requirements, but they do show up in your transcript and they do you know, make you look like a more interesting candidate. Um, there, the other thing is any class that you take above your base requirements. So if you've taken four science classes and then you take a fifth science class, that is considered an elective. And so some school like Northeastern and BU, they do not transfer your dual credits in general, except for classes that were uh, electives that were above what you were required. Essentially, they don't want you to double dip. They don't want you to get credit in high school and then get credit in college. They they think if you took a class that counted as a high school class, it shouldn't count as a college class. Right? So it's somewhere in between like the Harvard where they don't accept anything and the UMass Boston where they accept almost everything. Right? They'll only take those extra, extra credits. So every year, students from three, four years ago are writing to me and saying, can you let them know that this fifth class that I took was an elective so that I can get out of this requirement and so on. So in other words, it's going to save you money and it's going to make your application be more competitive to have more than just the bare minimum number of classes. Next one. How are we doing time-wise? It's 2.18. What's that? It's 2.18. 2.18, okay, you better get going. All right. If and, and this is good for people who might be on Zoom, um, but even for our own students, there are lots of other types of classes. They're not really dual enrollment classes, but there are other enrichment classes that you can do. Again, the key here is using these other classes to take things that are directly connected to your interests, right? When you're applying to college, it's essentially you're marketing yourself, right? You are the product and you want to stand out in a competitive applicant pool, right? So it's one thing to say I'm interested in computer science, but if you don't have anything to back it up, you haven't taken the classes, you haven't, you know, worked and, and maybe created a website or, uh, you know, done something in that field, it's just empty words, right? So you want to use your time in high school to explore those things that you might genuinely be interested in. Right, and these classes like edX and Coursera, they're free, massive, open online courses taught oftentimes by like MIT or Harvard professors or other great schools. Um, they don't tend, you can get some credit for them, but they don't tend to be credit bearing. But at the same time, you can certainly put them in your activities section and, and, uh, and so on. OutSchool, Udacity, LinkedIn Learning, Khan Academy, of course, I'm sure a lot of you use that. Skillshare is a great place to learn things about video editing and um, you know, uh, all sorts of like actual skills. You wanna build your skills. So some things are beyond just what's on your transcript. It's like, what are you actually able to do? If you're able to be an amazing graphic designer and you do extracurriculars or around that and you actually use your skills for real businesses and so on, then those things uh, stand out. So look into other options beyond just dual enrollment. All right. 
So the standard track at Elnor, you take four dual classes in the fall, four in the spring of your junior year, and then three in the fall and three in the spring of your senior year. That's the typical way, but it doesn't have to be that way. If you're trying to get some electives, you probably want to do four every single time. Some people take summer classes to get some electives done, or so they have fewer classes later. The reason senior year you want to go a little lighter is applying to college is essentially a fourth class, right? It's, and then some, right? So you don't necessarily want to have a really tough schedule in your senior fall. And then senior spring, right? If you've gotten in early to college or something, there's senioritis, it's a thing, right? So you don't necessarily want to have, you know, physics and calc two and all these really difficult classes. The other thing is colleges don't see the the grades and they don't even see the classes that you take your senior spring when they're making early uh, uh, early application decisions for you. So in other words, you want to you want if you're going to take physics or another difficult class, you want to take it ideally your junior year or at least your senior fall. Okay, taking it senior spring is good for your knowledge, but it's not good for standing out in college. Um, summer classes. Uh, it's certainly possible to take dual enrollment classes in the summer. Sometimes it does make sense, especially maybe if you're a ninth or tenth grader, you can you can look into it. Um, in general, though, usually all more kids are pretty strong academically, and the best use of their summer is to do something that's extracurricular, that's working, internships, that's uh, exploring something beyond just the classroom setting. You can do both sometimes, depending on the uh, the requirement. Um, but some people do uh, take summer classes to get ahead or because they've fallen behind. Um, yes. Even though the college makes you the senior in the class, do you still transfer those credits? Um, yes, you can transfer the credits. Yep, definitely. Uh, all right, we already talked about that. Um, yes, so again, pretty much I've talked about that. Do more than the basics. Keep going. <laughs> this is the typical track. I will share this PowerPoint um, with, or the slides with you guys and with anyone on, on uh, Zoom as well. Um, so this is the typical track. If you're for math, essentially, like I said before, if you're in CP, you usually would take college algebra, then pre-cal, then calc one, and then either statistics or something like quantitative reasoning. Otherwise, you're a little bit further ahead, pre-cal, calc one, calc two. Um, statistics accounting is also counted as a math. Students don't tend to like it, but it's actually one of the more useful skills you can develop. Um, and English, again, usually junior year, it's comp one, comp two, um, and then all those other interesting things uh, and so on. But these are just, the nice thing is there's not, you're not forced to do, as long as you get your um, schedule approved by uh, whoever the dual enrollment coordinator is, currently myself and Sister Sara, then um, you'll be able to uh, design a schedule that's really uh, close uh, to you. Um, keep going. All right, so this hasn't actually officially been passed, but this was something um, that we've considered doing, and uh, we can talk to Brother Sufyan about it. Um, there's something called the honors track, this would actually probably get you an associate's degree. Associate's degrees are not given by us. They're given by Quincy or Bridgewater or, or whomever gives the degree. So the requirements are from their side. But essentially, this is like taking four extra classes. Then instead of four, four, three, three, it would be five, five, four, four, or four, 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 and then two summer classes or something, something like that. But essentially, you'd be taking four elective classes on top of whatever you're doing here. And if the board slash Brother Sufyan uh, approved, we could have a different type of diploma that you get, like an honors diploma. Um, this was suggested by, by Dean Altia, who went to MIT and just got married last weekend. Anyone at their wedding? I know some of you. Yeah. Um, but she was saying when she got to MIT, she felt totally overmatched. And she really wished she'd taken more advantage of, of dual and so on. And so she had suggested this as a... Uh, thing you could do, especially if you're aiming for those top, top schools. Uh, next one. Lots of different options. 
right? Most of our students do do Quincy or uh, Bridgewater State, um, but others in this general area, Mansfield area, uh, BCC, which has a campus, satellite campus in Attleboro, um, and the main campus in Fall River. Uh, they, there's Quinsigamond, which if you're from the West, you're towards Worcester, that makes a lot of sense. Massasoit, right here in Brockton. Um, Roxbury Community College, right next to ISBCC. Um, Harvard Extension School. No one's taken a class there for a while, but for a, for a little while we had students taking, the, uh, taking uh, classes there. Those classes tend to be pretty challenging, quite expensive, but they definitely uh, look pretty impressive to have Harvard Extension classes on your uh, dual transcript. Um, and there are other choices. There are lots of different schools as the I think the next slide shows. Um, I, those are all schools we've done. So yeah, we don't need to go into that. Oh, actually that blue thing, uh, we don't need to necessarily click on it, but that blue link shows all the different schools in Massachusetts that offer dual enrollment. Now there's going to, if you're from a different state, if you're online and you're from a different state, there will be other ones. If, if you're from Rhode Island, for example, CCRI is a uh, school that students have taken classes at. Many colleges, it's a, it's a good source of income for them. So many colleges are open to dual enrollment. Um, so it, the main thing is, if you're taking classes in person, which I do recommend as much as possible, you want to probably take classes at the place that's easiest for you to get to. There are big differences between the schools, and we're going to talk about that. But the biggest thing is just the logistics of getting there. If you're taking online classes, then you know uh, it doesn't really matter exactly where you take it, um, other than the quality of the class and the the uh, system. Yes, uh, I know you like didn't mention that, but um, Fisher College is also yep, uh, it's on here. Keep going. So these are some other options. Uh, I'm not going to read through all this. You can take them at the UMass uh, ones, any of the state universities. There's a lot of other community colleges in different parts of the, the state. So there are a lot of options, and there will be options in other states as well. Keep going. All right, so this is a new one for this year. Fisher College uh, has reached out. Sister Sarah Marshall has been working closely with them. There's an opportunity to take a free class at Fisher College this summer. Okay, they have a program called College 101. And they have three choices of classes, principles of marketing, intro to criminology, or intro to psychology. Fisher is right in uh, Back Bay, right uh, in downtown Boston. So there's, their program is a, uh, it's from 9 to 10.30. Um, Monday and Wednesday, it's on campus in Boston. And Tuesday and Thursday, it's uh, virtual. Um, and so this is a great chance. I think is it open even for rising tenth graders, like ninth? I think so. Oh, you do? We should check. I bet they wouldn't be opposed to it. Yeah. But um, so this is a great chance to take a free class. There are I I'm not sure this year, but BCC and Massasoit have often had a uh, an ability to take a free class. Um, in the in the summer. So there are other options. We can do some exploration uh, around that. So obviously free is nice. Um, but again, um, if you're you know a, a 10th or 11th grader, I'd probably recommend doing more extracurricular things than just academic things. Um, is there a question over there? What's that? Not only is it a free class, but it's also free to share on one of your Right. Yeah. So any of these classes would take care of a social science. So you'd have, you know, fewer classes to do it all or more of a chance to get electives, that sort of thing. Um, okay. Next. All right. $64,000 question. Should I take classes in person or online? So during the pandemic, there was, there wasn't a question. You had to take it online. Pre-pandemic, there wasn't that much of a question. We used, when I first got here, there was a requirement that you had to take your classes in person, right? And now because, you know, colleges realize they can make a lot of money through these online classes, they've offered a lot, and it does give students some flexibility. As we'll see when we uh, have the current duals speak, some of them have taken all of their classes online. They've never been to a college campus. 
obviously that has some drawbacks. It, it prevents some of those other benefits that I said about going you know, to, uh, to campus and, and, uh, and so on. Others have taken everything in person. And then uh, some people, and I think this is probably the best option, do a hybrid with some of their classes uh, in person and then uh, some online. And that gives you more flexibility with your schedule, more chance to get the classes you want. Um, so uh, especially if you're taking a lab science, online labs, virtual labs are not the same, right? Some of you probably did them during the pandemic, right? We did them in our science classes, we had to, but it's not the same as being like dissecting a heart or you know, a frog or, or what, whatever, you know, you sciencey people do, right? It's it's very different when you're just like watching, someone in class was saying their labs consisted of watching like Amoeba Sisters videos, right? Like that's not really a lab. You, 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 want, you want to get that experience. Math is very difficult to teach online. Okay, Sister Siam Machala, master teacher, she did not like teaching during the pandemic because teaching math online is very, very difficult. Right? I think the social uh, social sciences, some English classes, um, you know, are at, easier at least to uh, transfer. Um, other things to consider: when you apply to college, you need recommendation letters, and they ideally you get recommendation letters from people who taught you your eleventh or twelfth grade year, but they taught you in you know math or science typically. Uh, I mean, sorry. Uh, English or math slash science, like humanities or STEM. So if you only take online classes, the chances that your professor really knows you, even knows what you look like, right, are not that not that high. So they're not gonna be able to write a very good letter if they even agree to write a letter at all. So one of the reasons to take classes in person is to really get to know your professors. Again, you're getting more opportunities, you're increasing that surface area for, for luck and so on. And if you are on campus, go to the off, uh, professor's office hours and really get to know them. Um, yeah, let's just keep going. Yep. Yep. Synchronous is like what we did during Zoom. I mean, during the pandemic on Zoom. Whereas asynchronous, they're all pre recorded. You really don't get to know your professors. Uh, definitely less ideal. Uh, keep going. All right, we're going to have the current duels give their tips. So I'm going to skip this slide. Actually, I think I'm going to skip quite a few of these. Oh. Um, yeah, this is a big one. Just don't be shy. You know, when you're on campus, right? Uh, you don't want to just only talk to other all nor kids and so on. Take advantage of being on campus. These pictures are pretty old. These girls are like, mashallah, super old now. Uh, keep going. All right, a, a little <laughs> word about college professors. All right, what my friends think I do. Let me see this girl looking wistfully, mashallah. What my students think I do, the evil professor. Okay, what my colleagues think I do. What my parents think I do, that's like from Goodwill Hunting. What I think I do, like the symphony. And what I actually do is this guy who feels totally overwhelmed. So being a professor is difficult. It's a different job than being a teacher, right? Um, as we'll see on the next slide. All right. So I don't know if you can read this. It's a, oh, stuff on the door. Yep. Um, but don't, don't, it would do that. All right. Class, today we are going to pop all of the bubbles in this packing material. Right. Not a not a very sophisticated class. Whereas this one is uh uh Count Dracula saying I only teach night classes, right? He's a vampire and so on. So in other words, <coughs> professors are not always of uniform quality, right? If you talk to the current duels, some professors are amazing, some of the best teachers they've ever had, and some of them really mail it in and they're not super uh engaged. 
or maybe they're qualified somehow, but they don't seem that qualified. Keep going. Right, so this is sort of how the whole thing works. Most community college professors are not full professors. They're not tenured professors, right? Where you pretty much have a job for life. They're adjunct professors. They don't get paid very much and they often work at many different campuses to try to make ends meet. And so they're a little overworked and therefore, keep going. Back. Therefore, they don't, they're not kind and gentle like your high school teachers. If you like are in a class here at Elmore, right, and you're not doing that well, then Sister Sarah is going to call your parents. They're going to bring them in for a meeting. And then you're going to beg them after you missed some quiz and they're going to open up Zoom for you after school and you're going to take your quiz. And like, it's very hard to fail classes here at Elmore. Right? Or we try to make it hard. The teachers bend over backwards to try to help you. It's not like that in college, right? In high school, you got three 90s and one zero, right? Then we'll call, we'll try to have interventions, we'll accept your late work. You end up still with an A minus or B plus. In college, you, you get three 90s, you're doing really well. Then you just skip one assignment. You say, hey, I'm not going to write that paper. I'm not going to take that, turn in that, uh, that major assignment. Um, then they just average it out. 90 plus 90 plus 90, 270, divided not by three, but by four, and then you get down into the high 60s, you get a B plus, right? And the colleges will not change. They'll say, these are your grades, right? So in other words, don't take it lightly. That's why people sometimes fail in, in uh, dual because they just simply don't take the classes. All right. Um, maybe, okay, so this, just before uh, I had class with the dual, so maybe this is a good time to transition to this. Um, I asked them in a Juno, I mean, in a Jupiter discussion about, you know, some of their tips, some of their, the challenges, some of the, the benefits, um, and any other uh, advice. So let's just, let me open this up for uh, some of the dual students. So <laughs> you guys can just yell out. Um, but what were, we just did that pod, so hopefully you remember. What are some of your biggest pieces of advice, especially things that I've not said just now? Okay, yep. Communicate with your, wait, you said that, but build a relationship with them. Build the relationship with the professors. Good, yep. Just as effective, go like other teachers in the classes. It's just like, no matter what school you go to, there's like a really good chance you're never going to see them after that class. Mm -hmm. So what it's great to like get to know them. So if you ever miss a class or something, you get notes. Yep, and excellent. Like, chill about, never mind. So yeah. So, so making connections with the other students in class uh, uh, and uh, trying to take advantage of that and find opportunities that way. Yep. Um, I would say if you're able to commute by train and it's easy for you to get home, even if your parents, your, uh, your parents pick you up, consider joining like different clubs or programs that are okay. available, mostly at BSU. Um, something that you'd be interested in or would benefit you. Yep. So we don't have as many extracurricular opportunities right here at school. So it is really good to try to take advantage of uh, clubs and other things that, that do exist um, at a big uh, school like, like uh, Bridgewater. That's a really good point. But that's obviously if you're going in person. And, you know, there is the whole transportation factor, right? So if it's easy for you to get uh, home by public transportation, that, that opens up a lot of opportunities. Noor? Um, I'd probably say like build like a really structured and like strong like routine and schedule for yourself. So like if you have your like free time set aside and your study time set aside, like it'll make it really easy for you so you don't fall off. Excellent. So especially if you're doing online classes, if you're doing all online classes, it might sound like, oh, I'm totally free, nothing going on on Monday, Wednesday, right? It, then you're going to fall way behind and you're going to get yourself in trouble. So having the discipline to set a schedule for yourself. Definitely very important. Yep. Check your email. Check your email. That's a huge one, right? And someone mentioned put um, turn on notifications. You will get an email from these colleges. That's how they will communicate with you. They will most likely not use your personal email. And a lot of times people don't check their Bridgewater email, right? And they miss important things. They end up having to pay insurance that they could have waived if they just checked their email. Now they're out two grand because of missing an email. So you want to check your official college email. 
Uh, other tips. I, I know I'm I'm not a dual. Yep. So a part of getting to know these professors, a lot of these professors have research um, opportunities and labs of work that you could do. So you may be able to work as a professor over the summer that you haven't before. So it could be, you know, if you had a good relationship with their time, you could go away to the professor and they were doing research over the summer and you were able to be part of that research. So, you know, always interact with the professors, find out what they're doing, find out what their research is. So, you know, this is a good opportunity for you to, you know, get some. 100%, right? So, so speaking, getting to know your professors and their unique specialties, right? Professors have done their PhDs, right? They've gone really deep in one particular area. Find out what that area is. Ask them questions about it. Be interested, right? Don't focus on being interesting all the time. Try to be interested in other people, and then they will find you interesting, and they will remember you, and they will write good rec letters for you. They will recommend things for you. Yes? Uh, to build on that, also seek out major like people who are majoring in something you're interested in, and mm -hmm. just to get a taste of like yep. what it's like actually. Definitely. Yep. So take advantage of your fellow students. If you're at Bridgewater, you're thinking about doing pre med. Find someone who is a pre med. Find a junior or a senior. Find out what their life was like. Right. Find out uh, what their course of study is like. Um. Okay. Pros. We talked about a lot of pros. What about from your student perspective? What are some of the pros, Jude? Oh, nothing to give a tip. Okay, tip. What about Cindy? Most of like all of her classes are, well, most of them are kind of organized to be fifteen minutes apart. Mm -hmm. And like you might think it's like she'll have like an hour or two breaks between classes, but it's so boring. Like, there's really nothing to do. So just make try to get rid of all your classes. Like try to just do it. Like, back to back to back. Yeah. All right. So you're back. saying yeah, generally. When you're designing your schedule, think of the logistics of it. And if you put a you know break between each one. I mean, the, the other thing is colleges do have great libraries and they have resources in the libraries. They have tutors. Um, one thing no one's mentioned is there are some cost saving ways. You can rent your textbooks. Colleges also usually have the textbooks. Professors have put them in the library for people who can't afford to buy the books. Um, so there are lots of uh, ways to try to you know cut down on the expense uh the yep. pros yeah yeah pros. so one of the main pros is that you could choose the classes to your capability mm -hmm. and like you could choose the classes you'll get a's then right probably mm -hmm. or you could choose the classes you find difficult and you'll use yep. them the major so generally that ability to design your own schedule choose the classes that are interesting to you that's definitely a pro any other pros especially ones we didn't mention kareem uh you guys have like a long break uh, i think you're doing Mm -hmm. Yep. Exploring the campus, definitely, hundred percent. Uh. I have a question. Yep. Um, when you're applying for like, let's say Bridgewater, or anything, is it like a real college where you need to like go on the common app and like submit an essay and so and all these you mean for dual or for, for dual, yeah. yeah no for dual they have a separate application. So I looked like I think it seemed a little later this year. I think the Bridgewater applications due towards the end of May. We will share that with you. So if you're a 10th or 11th grader and you're planning to do Bridgewater, their deadline is during this academic year. Quincy is a little bit more uh, flexible in terms of the deadline. Uh, we're going to talk about the difference between those two schools in particular uh, a little later. But any other pros that we have not mentioned? Yep. Like the freedom you have as an individual, you don't have to Okay. Yep. So, so definitely being on a college campus or obviously being online, you have far more freedom than you do in uh, in a high school environment, especially maybe a, a fairly conservative religious school, um, for better or worse. <laughs> yes. Um, it's kind of weird, but you not know, like actually. I mean, I'm excited because I don't think anything mostly. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about myself there because no, nobody, like almost nobody there is like me. If they are, they don't have them look it. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't, you were, you really wouldn't like tell a most of too far away. So you're kind of alone. So you're in charge of like, you know, being like getting to know the time, you know, or like even an outfit. Like right. So it, it, in other words, I think what you're saying is it helps you with your self-development and especially your identity as a Muslim, there's no musallah like this for you to come where everyone is expected to pray. You sort of have to make your own way, 
which is the same thing in the in the real world. Uh, and if you want to maintain all the beautiful practices we do here, you need to get started early. Yep. Um, it's not really a con, but at Bridgewater, you could just take an empty class and pray there. Mm -hmm. Probably you should. Yep. They also have they do a lot of events for charity and like That's general. Sure. in general. Um, yep, so so Bridgewater in particular has a pretty active MSA. We're gonna talk about those two schools uh soon. Um, any other, uh, any cons, any challenges that you guys wanted to highlight? Um, one of you mentioned in your pod classes move really quickly, especially flash classes, which are like seven week classes as opposed to 10, 11 week. Um, if you miss a week of assignments, you get overwhelmed. Uh, a lot of you talked about the challenge of choosing classes. That's especially true at Bridgewater where you don't get first priority. You get the sort of leftover classes that the their full-time students haven't taken. So it's harder to get design the schedule and so on. Less of a problem at, at Quincy. Um, any other things you think? All right, let's keep going. What what time is that? I want to make sure we have some QRs. Okay. So we better we better finish this. So tuition. So the all nor tuition, I don't know if this are still the up-to-date numbers, it may have changed a little bit, but essentially it's $2,000 less your uh, your 11th and 12th grade year, okay? So that money, it's less because you're on campus less and you need to pay for dual enrollment. Your payment for dual goes to, it's a financial relationship between you and the school. You don't pay El Nor and then we pay them. You pay Quincy, Bridgewater, whoever it is directly. Um, there used to be a really big difference in cost, right? Quincy classes cost $156 per credit. So a three credit cl class costs around $500. Bridgewater, a three credit class used to cost $200. From what I understood from looking on the website, they've changed that now a credit at Bridgewater is $180. So it'll be just as expensive or even more expensive. Just a little surprising to me and I wanna get some clarity around that. But one of the big draws at Bridgewater in addition to some other things, used to be that it was quite a bit cheaper. I'm not sure that is the case. Unfortunately, there don't seem to be as many really inexpensive options. <clears throat> so even if there is a cost associated with this, remember it's much cheaper to get the classes here than to do them in four years. Saving one year of tuition of a $75,000 tuition is more than going to make up whatever you pay for these classes. Um, so yeah, some of this stuff is a little bit out of date. If this is accurate, Massasoit actually does look pretty um, inexpensive. Like I said, there are free classes available, like one single free class that you can take. So if finances are really tight, then talk to me, we'll do some research and we can try to come up with a, come up with a plan. Uh, keep going. Um, yeah, skip this because it's a little out of date. Uh, yeah, let's just just keep going until I tell you. These are just like courses that we take. Uh, actually, go back to the last one. I'll, I'll just show you something. So these are GPAs. You can see that math tends to be the class where people do least well, right? Uh, 3.08 is the average GPA, so which is around a B, whereas History and uh, English, you know, those are those are much higher. Those are the average uh, grades. Uh, yep, next one. Um, so these are just the most popular classes. Almost everyone takes stats and bio and, and things like that, uh, and so on. Keep going. These are a little out of date. So comp one, the average grade is 3.91. I like to take credit for that because I was the English teacher uh, and I prepared you so well. Um, whereas pre-cal, look at that. 2.81, okay? So pre-cal is one of those uh, weeder classes that weeds out people. So it's usually the first math class that you, you're taking, you're not used to it quite yet. So make sure to buckle down uh, with that. Um, but in general, see how all those math classes, like I said, those tend to be the harder classes grade-wise. Keep going. 
And this is just information. The hyperlinks are there for you to actually apply to the schools. I think we're pretty much at the end. Uh, yep. 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 Yeah, like I said, Harvard Extension is good. So if you have any questions, uh, including for the people online, you can email me, um, my school email. We have a Path to College WhatsApp group. How many of you guys are in that group? Okay, so some of you are. It's uh, it's a mostly parents, but there are a lot of students in it as well. Um, it has 900 people in one of the groups and another four or 500 in the other one. It's a great place. There's very high level discussions, arguments, uh, other sorts of things about college in general and education. It's a good, good, uh, good place for you to crowdsource information. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot in addition to being able to educate people with all the stuff I know. Um, and then there is a way to uh, book time uh, with me, especially for the people on uh, on Zoom. Um, uh, we can share that. I can put it in the follow up email as well. Um, okay, so now let's open up to questions, especially from the Zoom crowd, because a lot of you guys were asking questions as we went. What are some of the questions that came in? Uh, you can you can make it big. Yes. So can you just let me know some of the questions? What's the invite link to Path to College? Uh, can you if you right click that? And copy link. You might have to get out of the presentation and then and then go to that slide, right click it and drop it in. You can drop the link to my um to book my schedule as well. Um have other questions come in? Oh, one question that people were asking me before, the difference between AP classes and dual enrollment classes. Okay, so AP classes are similar to dual because they're also college classes that you take while in school. AP classes are typically taught by high school teachers. Okay, so if you go to a public school or a private school that offers AP classes, they're taught by teachers who work at those schools. Okay, the other thing about the AP that's the biggest difference is you take an exam, an AP exam at the end. So if you're taking AP literature or AP uh, computer science principles or micro or all the other APs, right? At the end of the year in May, there's an exam and you get graded on a five point scale, right? Um, and uh, in order for the credit to transfer, you usually need to get either a four or a five on that exam. So you might take that whole AP class and then not do that well on the exam, get a three or lower and your credit doesn't transfer. Whereas dual classes uh, typically do transfer as long as you pass the class, of course. Okay? Some colleges might require you to get an A or B, but it's easier to get an A or B in a class that looks at your performance over the course of the whole semester versus just on one day, one exam. Um, so that's one, one uh, big difference. Also, AP classes are one year long. And they'll usually only get you out of one credit, whereas with dual, you're, you'll take you know, two classes, semester classes, which might get you out of more. That's not always true. The credit transfer thing is very much college specific. Some colleges see things differently. So yes. Um, I mean, some people have done that. Uh, it, you definitely, if you if you're an all North kid and you didn't, you can take AP tests even if you don't take the AP class. Okay, so if you wanted to study economics or something like that that we don't offer here, you studied on your own, you got the the textbook and uh, uh, prep book, and you wanted to take it, you could, and then that could potentially give you give you credit. Uh, not a very common thing for all North kids to do. Um, some of the people I meet through my business are insane and they're taking like seven AP classes their senior year, five of them in school and two of them self-study and so on. You don't need to do that stuff to stand out. Okay, There are these memes going around about what you need to get into Harvard or MIT. And it's just like a lot of not great information. Because yes, obviously if you're like superstar student that, that can help, grades alone will never they're a, a requirement, but not sufficient, required, but not sufficient to get you into a top school. You do need to have great grades to get into a top school, but if you just have great grades, it will not unlock many doors at the top, top school. It'll unlock a lot of other doors, right? But you wanna be more than a student. Most people 
Some people just love studying and love classes. You're very academically minded, that's great. Maybe you'll be a professor someday, right? But other people, you know, there's more to life than just academics, right? You wanna do more than just be in class all the time, right? And so, you know, that's one of the great things about our dual program. If you are doing classes online, you have way more free time in your schedule than the vast majority of high school students. So if you're doing that, there are some drawbacks to it, but there are opportunities as well. You can, uh, you know, uh, get real world experience in a way that other people can't even imagine. During the school day, right, you can be off working a job or doing an internship or doing some other thing that your average person can't do. Um, Mohammed? What's up? SAT is coming back. Yep, the SAT, which was um, optional for so long, is coming back. I see questions on there, but yeah. I, I don't. I, I, I Can you just. Yeah, we'll read. What? It's just one. Um, what's your opinion on Dean College for dual enrollment? Dean, the one in Franklin? Yeah. I, I, so I think Dean is a good school. Um, definitely, we've had students go to Dean before. I don't know if they've done dual enrollment, they have gone there after school. Um, any of these campuses, that's that's the other thing, like we talk a lot about prestige of schools, like American higher ed is like the envy of the whole world. There are people over in you know Pakistan or wherever who would die to go to any sort of school, Northern Arkansas State, right? They would love to go there. Bridgewater State, they would bend over backwards to get to that campus, right? And we just take them for granted. So all of these schools are, are great schools. You can get great opportunities uh, and they have all those benefits. Yep. So if you are, again, able to travel, right? Go to the Go to the No doors are closed. Yeah, so you're able to use it, you can do it online, whatever. So, this is, um, what's our colleges, any thoughts on left versus dual enrollment? That, that's, those are the most problems, but those are definitely not. Okay. All right. Sorry. Um, any, any other questions? I know there's one more on Zoom, but anyone else in person? Very good. Um, so there was a question, what was it? Yeah, so CLEP are classes that are offered by um, uh, uh, college, uh, through College Board and so on. Um, there, there are some benefits, They're, they can be cost effective, they can be uh, more flexible and so on, um, but they don't have all the sort of benefits we were talking about, especially of in-person um, uh, classes on college campuses and all the growth that, that that engenders. But happy to talk about that more like privately and individually. Um, anything else? Hi, right, it's just about three o'clock. Jazakallah khair. Nothing else on Zoom. Anything else come up through there? Huh? Okay. Jazakallah khair. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Shalom la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik.